My name is Naveen Rao. I'm Senior Vice President for Health at Rockefeller Foundation and I'm based in New York City. If you ask me why I believe ending maternal and child mortality is possible, I'm reminded of a quote of a famous Egyptian obstetric gynecologist who is the father of this field, who very famously said, women are dying not because we don't know how to save them. They're dying because we have yet to decide they're worth saving. We have the tools. We know why these women and children are dying. And the treatment for these have been discovered in the 1940s. I really truly believe this time around we have an opportunity to save their lives because we have tools we didn't have in the past that data science and data technology afford us. So I feel the glass is half full, I'm optimistic, and I truly believe we can make a difference and end all preventable child and maternal mortality in our lifetime. So Shahid, I want to take you to this journey. I recently was in Jaipur, and we went into the villages. So we were in, in the remote villages. And what was amazing is in a couple of homes that I, and it is uniform, and I've seen this even in Africa, so it's not just unique, is Today, even in those remote villages, in that hut, the husband, who is a man, is a farmer, and he has some kind of phone, and on his phone, he already has some apps that tell him weather forecasts. For example, he knows when to harvest, when to plant. He has an app that tells him what is the price of his produce in the market, so he knows when to sell. And he has an app, something like an Uber, uh, to get his produce to the marketplace. In that same house, the wife, who is usually the community health worker, she has 15 registers. Whereas the husband is already in the 20th century, she is still in the 18th century. She has 15 registers she's carrying, depending on which sponsor. So she goes to the same house. Because it's a malaria sponsor, she will count malaria bed nets. Tomorrow she'll go to the same house because somebody wants to know the immunization schedule. She'll count the children with immunization. She'll go to the same house for nutrition. She'll go to the same house. She's filling out 15 registers. Whereas the husband already has insights. So we asked ourselves, why can't the woman, in this instance, the community health worker, have the same kind of insights in her hand to help her do her job better and what we are calling precision public health. So we are trying to take public health to the 21st century and we feel optimistic because of what data, data science can afford us now. So we realize that public health as it is being done today, as I said, is still locked into the old system of top down, where somebody sitting in an office somewhere decides what the community health worker, and there's a disconnect between what the community health worker can or will, will do. We realize that the way to solve this problem is to work in partnership. And it is quite well written up in the, in the public health literature that there is what they call the golden triangle. And the golden triangle puts the country at the top of the triangle. And it is the country's responsibility for its populous health. So eventually the country is responsible for the health of the country. But by itself, if the government and the country is unable or unwilling or is not able to do it, then the only way to do it is through this golden triangle. And the other end of the golden triangle is civil society. That includes multilaterals, unilaterals, all the civil society, NGOs, philanthropists. And the third part of the triangle is the private sector. So unless the private sector, the civil society, the government work together, this problem is too big for any one sector to work. Quite often, two sectors come together, but magic happens when all three sectors come. So we, with that mindset, we were looking, how can we advance, how can we complement, how can we help Government of India achieve its stated goals? And its stated goals are basically sustainable development goal number three for health. And the way, the pathway that the government has said they'll do that is through primary health centers, achieving universal health coverage. So the magic words are UHC, PHC, SDG3. 
we asked ourselves, how can we work with local partners to achieve this goal? And clearly, the Piramal Foundation's uh, mission, vision, uh, outlook mirrors our own. Um, they talk, and, and I've heard uh, Dr. Swati Piramal, and I congratulate her, ha talks about the importance of health being a right, not a privilege for everyone. Dr. Swati Piramal talks about Seva Bhav as an undercurrent for everything they do at the Piramal Foundation. And that mirrors very much what Rockefeller Foundation feels about service and serving. So we felt that these two organizations can come together and help the country achieve its UHC, PHC, SDG3 goals. And that's what we would like to do. So the mission of Rockefeller Foundation is humanity, the well-being of humanity for all. And to me, the basis of all well-being is health. If you don't have health, you have nothing. In fact, Dr. Tedros, the head of WHO, very famously says, when you have health, you want many other things. When you don't have health, there's only one thing you want. So if health is the basis of all well-being, then we asked ourselves, is it appropriate that 50% of the world today cannot have access to essential health services. Is it appropriate or is it, is it conscionable that, that health has become a privilege based on where you are born, what country you live in, what religion you are, and not based on uh, what your needs are. So take today the divide. If today's the divide, class divide is money, and there's haves and the have-nots. I predict that the class divide of the future is going to be data, and the divide is going to be those who have access to data and those who don't have access to data. And again, those who have access to data will have better health than those who have, don't have access to data. If that is the case, and if there is this data inequity exacerbating health inequity, we asked ourselves, can we work with Piramal Foundation, set up a a platform and be able to bring data insights through artificial intelligence, cloud computing. Can we do all this to give power to the community health worker so that she can do her work better in a more precise way? We're calling this precision public health. So Rockefeller Foundation has been in the health space since 1913, over 100 years ago. And the story goes that Rockefeller Foundation decided to eliminate hookworm, which was plaguing the southern part of America. And they made a commitment in around the 1913 to eliminate hookworm in America. And while doing so, they, heard, they learned a lot of lessons. What does it take to eliminate hookworm, including sanitation? And, and, and that whole activity led to what they realized was public health. So they established, we established public health as a science. We established the first school of public health, the Johns Hopkins. We helped countries like China and Indonesia and Thailand establish public health as a, as a, as a science. So we feel now on that legacy, we have the responsibility to now take it to the 21st century and bring data and data science to public health. So if Rockefeller established public health in 1913, we believe in 2019 we need to take it to precision public health and bring data and data science. Shad, just think about it. In our own lifetime, in the last 10 years, how our lives have changed. I remember going buying records, tapes. Today, in our own lifetime, music has become zeros and ones and is streamed. I remember uh, when I would take a road trip, I'd have maps in the car to try to help me navigate. Today, I, I don't remember when I last opened a map. The GPS helps me so much. I remember I used to go to the bank. I'm sure you remember going to the bank uh, once a month for checks. And I haven't been to the bank, I don't know how long. So if data has disrupted our lives in so many ways in our own lifetime, in the last 15 years. Why is public health still being done how my grandfather was practicing medicine? Or why, why is it being done the same way uh, for the last 100 years? 
And so we asked ourselves, does it have to be like that? And do these poor, vulnerable mothers and children have to die? Today, the statistic is, you'll be amazed, 16,000 lives are taken every day. Every day, 16,000 lives. Uh, about 15,000 children and 1,000 mothers die every day. To put that in perspective, that is like 40 jumbo jets. 40 jumbo jets crash every day, all preventable.